Good evening, everyone. How are you all? Sorry for the trouble tonight. I didn't know that how the Zoom ID has got changed. I did an update of Zoom. Maybe that's why. So I hope that you guys joined properly. So let's let me just have a look on the Facebook. See that if there is anyone else having trouble joining. All right, so let's start our tonight's session then. So tonight we are going to do cardiology theory session. And you guys already did our first class on cardiology. How, how did you guys go with that? Did you guys happen to go through the JM or the lecture? You haven't got the lecture note. Maybe you have done the recording. We have already given the recording in the Facebook. So have you guys started your preparation? Yes, very good. So any questions from our previous class? All good. So no questions so far. Now, let's start the session tonight. If there was anyone who could not join this session, so we'll, we'll pause the recording of the class and obviously then they will be able to go through this session again. So that should be fine. Now, we finished the most important part of, or part of cardiology, which was your MI and chest pain related theory session. Tonight, we're going to finish cardiology. So the main focus of tonight's session mainly will be on your you can say heart failure, which is very important. We will go through hypertension. We will go through probably valvular heart disease. Okay, and some of the other random topics from cardiology. Now, cardiology will not be finished until we do the ECG class. ECG class is not under the free session. So once you join the course, you will get the ECG class as well. And during the ECG class, along with the ECG, we also covered the palpitation chapter because it's mostly from ECG. So that's one part from cardiology will be still left. Now, before we start the session, I want you guys to have a look on this video, understand that how heart failure happens, and then we will go through the theory. A healthy heart, as seen here, beats approximately 60 to 100 times a minute, providing oxygen late blood, and congestion due to fluid retention is known as congestive heart failure. All right, so that's actually a, like a little bit idea about how heart failure happens. Okay, now we're going to move into the session. So for cardiology, remember that what are the resources that we follow? We follow our gym. The, the first one that we start with is the John Murta. And then also we take some help from the Kaplan Step to CK. Kaplan Step to CK has a very, very good information about most of the theory that you need to learn for the exam. But time to time, we might need to take, take some help from other resources especially from online resources, which is very important for the exam also. Recently, I have seen a, some change in the AMC MCQ resource guideline, and they actually did not, did not say anything about JM, but they mostly focused on those online resources. So they focused on RACGP guideline, especially for medicine-related theory things, RCH, which is the Royal Children Hospital Guideline for Pediatrics, and it has almost everything that you need. And also like ETG guidelines, so therapeutic guideline is also an important one. 
throughout the course, we will go through that time to time when we need it. It's a huge thing. You don't need to go through the whole stuff, just the important one will be covered by us time to time. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much everything that we need to follow. And obviously we will also go through some of the question solvation, QBank, all of those things. Uh, guys, I just got a very urgent call to hold. Please, please excuse me just for a moment. Okay, just, just give me two minutes. Sorry for it.
All right, guys, I'm really sorry for the trouble today. Uh, I had it like a really, very really urgent call. So let's just start, guys. Sorry for that. So when you start working in Australia, you will end up getting call like this, like in the middle of the evening, maybe even in Sunday. Okay, so that happens very commonly. So be embrace yourself for such, such a life. All right, so. Okay, now we are going to start with the congestive cardiac failure. Okay. So for congestive cardiac failure, let's, let's just have a look on this, on this question. A 60-year-old man presents to his primary care physician for several months of dyspnea on exertion, exercise intolerance, and lower extremity swelling. He has a past medical history of sarcoidosis. On physical exam, he has jugular venous distension and pitting edema in the lower extremities. An echocardiogram shows an ejection fraction of 35%. When you get an ejection fraction less than 45, you immediately think that this is a heart failure patient. So you can see it's a 60 year old present to the primary care physician for dyspnea on exertion. So patient having shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, and lower extremity swelling, which is the edema, and also having a history of sarcoidosis, J JPP increased, that's one of the very important sign of heart failure, and pitting edema. So these are actually the how a heart failure patient presents to you in the emergency department or to a GP practice. Okay, now read this case one and case two for me and say that what do you think about the diagnosis of case one and what do you think about the diagnosis of case two? You have got one minute time to answer it. Okay, so let's have a look. Have a read through it again. See that what do you feel about case number one at least. If case number one, you, you can see that 62-year-old having a hypertension and dyslipidemia presenting with dyspnea and lower extremity edema for two months. JPP is raised, S3 gallop rhythm is there, and apical impulse is displaced. Chest X-ray shows enlarged cardiac silhote. Do you know what is the cardiac silhote? It's the cardiac shadow that you can see in a chest X-ray. And if it is enlarged, that suggests the heart is enlarged as well. And when heart is enlarged, that's, that sometimes can be a feature of heart failure also. An echocardiogram shows a dilated lip ventricle with an ejection fraction of 35%. There are two types of heart failure. That's why there is one, one case and another case. We'll go through each and everything, and then you will understand what is the case one diagnosis and what is the case two diagnosis. I'll come to this same question after the discussion, and I will ask you again, and you will tell me what is the diagnosis now. Let's just give a pause to that first. Now, the symptoms in summary of a heart failure patient. Now, 
you, you, you have seen the video, right? So if I draw a picture of heart, and let's say that this is your aortic valve, and that's the aorta. So you need to understand the basic pathophysiology of heart first. So what happens normally, like from all the venous system from your extremities comes from superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. So inferior vena cava brings all the heart from your lower extremity to the right atrium. Same with the superior vena cava also, also brings all the venous blood from your upper extremity. And then it also comes to the right atrium. So this, these are venous blood. That means these are carbon dioxide blood. After the, all the blood comes into right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, it goes to the right ventricle. And then from the right ventricle, it goes through the pulmonary artery. So this is your pulmonary valve. Through the pulmonary valve, blood will flow through the pulmonary artery to the lungs, right? And what happens in the lungs? In the lungs, this carbon dioxide blood will get oxygenated. And then through the pulmonary vein, blood, which is now oxygenated blood, will come to the left atrium. So if I summarize again, so blood coming from superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, coming to the right atrium, then through the tricuspid valve, it goes to the right ventricle, through the pulmonary valve, deoxygenated blood goes through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. In the lungs, it gets oxygenated, and then the, this oxygenated blood will be taken by the pulmonary vein to your left atrium. Through the left atrium, it goes to the left ventricle. And in between left atrium and left ventricle, the valve that we have is the mitral valve. And then from the left ventricle, blood will go through the aortic valve to the aorta and then to the whole body. So that's how your normal heart works. And when a patient having heart failure, this normal mechanism will be hampered. Okay, so there can be left heart failure, there can be right heart failure. In left heart failure, the left ventricle, which is the, this part of your heart, it is supposed to pump enough blood into your body so that every organ in your body gets blood supply. Now, if this left ventricle is not pumping properly, then there will be heart failure. So if the problem is in the pump, that's called systolic problem or systolic heart failure. Because when heart contracts, then the blood flows through the aorta into the aortic, into the, sorry, the blood flows through the aortic valve into the aorta and then goes to the whole body. So if pumping action is impaired, that suggests systolic heart failure. Just in the contrary, when heart goes into diastole, that means it goes into relaxation. And when heart relaxes, so there will be much space in your heart and blood from all the extremities then can accumulate in your heart. If the relaxation does not happen properly, so if the problem is with the relaxation of the heart muscle, that's the time when we call it as a diastolic heart failure. Okay. Now, ejection fraction, how we actually measure ejection fraction? We measure ejection fraction by the amount of cardiac output. And what is cardiac output? Every time your heart is contracting, how much blood it is coming out through the aorta in your whole body, that's the ejection fraction. 
So if someone's ejection fraction is low, what does it suggest? It suggests the cardiac output is low. And which has the greatest impact on cardiac output, systole or diastole? Systole, because cardiac output means your heart needs contraction, your heart needs systole. So if ejection fraction is low, what's the heart failure you are talking about? Systolic or diastolic? Guys? Systolic, right? So that's, that's why if you get a patient with a symptoms and signs of heart failure, and then you look at the ejection fraction that's lower than 45, that's systolic heart failure. In case of diastolic heart failure, there will be no problem with the cardiac output. The problem is in the relaxation. So ejection fraction will be fine. Okay, so now that you know the most important two different type of heart failure, let's go into the symptoms and sign of heart failure. So patient with heart failure, because their heart cannot pump enough blood, they start to, to have accumulation of blood in their extremities. Because let's say your heart is not pumping blood. So some left ventricle is not pumping, then there will be overflow in the left atrium, then overflow in the lungs, then to the pulmonary artery, right ventricle, and then right atrium, and then superior vena cava, then inferior vena cava, everything gets overflow. And then what will happen? There will be accumulation of blood in your extremities, in your lungs, everywhere there will be fluid accumulation. And the symptoms that you get in a heart failure patient is because of this fluid accumulation. So if you get fluid accumulation in the lungs, you will get shortness of breath. And obviously there is a effect of gravity on the fluid accumulation. So when you lie, lie down, there will be more fluid accumulation in your lungs. So that's called autopnea which means that increasing shortness of breath when you lie down. Because of that, you might also get kind of dry, irritating cough, especially at nighttime. Patient will be having fatigue, lethargy. Because of fluid accumulation, they can have increased weight gain. Ankle edema or pitting edema because of fluid accumulation in their lower legs. Fluid accumulation in the hepatic portal venous system that will result to hepatic congestion, and sometimes in CCF patient, you also get tender hepatomegaly. Because of poor cardiac output, your brain will not get enough blood supply and you will feel dizzy. Sometimes even you will lose consciousness. That is what we call as syncope. Okay. So left heart failure and right heart failure, and that's another subtype of heart failure. Left heart failure, is usually the first thing that happen. And most of the time, left heart failure eventually causes right heart failure. So if the most important finding in left heart failure is that patient with left heart failure, what will happen is that left ventricle is not pumping enough blood, overflow of the left atrium, and then overflow of the lungs. So, Fluid will get accumulated in the lungs and patient will present to you with acute shortness of breath, orthopnea, okay? And if you try to auscultate their lung base, you will find out bivasilar crepitations. So bivasilar crepitation, and then also you are getting shortness of breath, orthopnea, that suggests left heart failure. Along with that, you also get hard heart sound in left heart failure, which we call gallop rhythm. And once you get left heart failure, your lungs get accumulated with fluid. And there is a name for that. What we call it? Acute pulmonary edema. Acute pulmonary edema usually occurs because of left heart failure. So the diagnosis becomes acute left heart failure, sorry, acute pulmonary edema due to left heart failure. And that's the time you get all these features of left heart failure like dyspnea, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. In the sign, you get bilateral 
basal crepitation, and S3 galloprenum. Once left heart failure starts, fluid will also start to accumulate in the right ventricle or right heart. So right heart starts to fail. And when right heart starts to fail, there will be overflow of right ventricle, then right atrium, and then superior and inferior vena cava. So for superior vena cava overflow, you will get raised JVP. For inferior vena cava overflow, you will get peripheral or ankle edema. Sometimes you can also get hepatic congestion or tender hepatomegaly, just for same cause. You can get ascites as well. Okay? So these are the finding of right heart failure, raised JVP, tender hepatomegaly, and peripheral edema. And if we want to talk about physical findings in heart failure as a whole, you get bivesicular crepitation, pulmonary edema, or peripheral edema, ascites, hepatomegaly, raised JVP. We already know about systolic and diastolic heart failure already. So I am not going to show you the video now because I, I guess that you, you guys understand it properly. If you want to know a little bit more about it, go through this video in the YouTube. Now we know about the sign and symptom of heart failure. We know about the type of heart failure. Now, what, which one is more common, systolic or diastolic? Systolic is more common. The classic heart failure is systolic failure due to inadequate pumping of the heart. In this case, the ventricle will be dilated because the ventricle is not pumping blood and will contract poorly, which will cause ejection fraction less than 40%. Even less than 45% becomes heart failure. And diastolic heart failure, it's impairment of the ventricular feeling with a preserved systolic function. It should be suspected in the elderly with hypertension and a normal heart size on the chest X-ray who present with dyspnea or pulmonary edema. See that the, in this case, patient heart will not be enlarged because it cannot get relaxed properly. So heart size normal on the chest X-ray, but patient is an elderly patient, hypertensive patient presenting to you with dyspnea or pulmonary edema. You suggest it as a diastolic heart failure. Sometimes a patient can have both systolic and diastolic at the same time also. So we already know what is systolic heart failure, ejection fraction less than 45. What are the causes of systolic heart failure? The most common cause is ischemic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. Along with that, patient with hypertension can also get systolic heart failure. Patient with ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction can get it. Okay, Patient with aortic stenosis can get it. So it depends on a lot of underlying heart condition. If you get a patient with heart failure, symptoms and sign, but preserved ejection fraction, that is what we call as diastolic heart failure. This is from your jam. Systolic heart failure, ischemic heart disease, including previous MI is the most common cause. And also hypertension is the second common cause. Diastolic heart failure, Obesity, hypertension, diabetes are significant risk factor. Same ischemic heart disease, hypertension, aortic stenosis, AF, all of them can cause diastolic heart failure. Now, the most important for your exam, which comes very frequently, let's say you have got a patient having features of heart failure and you have seen the patient for the first time. What is your next most appropriate investigation for that patient. Remember the term next most appropriate, that means initial. If a patient with features of heart failure presents to you acutely, what you will do next? What is the investigation of, like initial investigation?
very good, Dr. Umaima. So ECG should be your first investigation. Let's just remember one thing, like you are working in a hospital, similar patient came to your emergency department. Will you just send the patient to the echocardiogram without doing an ECG? No, never ever. Some, because you know already the most common cause of heart failure is ischemic heart disease or myocardial infarction. What if the patient having MI? And then it is complicated with a heart failure. So you should always start with the ECG first. And then after ECG, then if they ask you what is the most appropriate investigation, then you can, you can actually choose echocardiogram. Okay? So that's a very important confusion that happens with a lot of candidates. We can do chest X-ray, but not, it's not an important part of investigation. Now, how about BNP? Sometimes we do BNP in a heart failure patient, but not to diagnose heart failure. We do it as a prognostic factor. The higher the BNP is, the worst the prognosis is, or the severe the condition of the heart failure is. So you don't do BNP to diagnose a patient with heart failure. But if, if that is a case, like you are in an area where there is no echocardiogram available and you need to find out if this patient ha having heart failure or not, then as a second line, you can do BNP. Okay, but never ever, if echocardiogram is available, you will never ever do BNP to diagnose heart failure. Now come to the management of heart failure. So starting with the systolic heart failure management. So for someone who is having heart failure, the stepwise treatment should start with ACE inhibitor first. So always any patient having heart failure, like a systolic heart failure, you should start with ACE inhibitor or ARB first. With that, you can use frusemide. Frusemide is mainly for someone who is having congestion features, like acutely edematous. Especially frusemide should be started if someone having acute pulmonary edema or having trouble breathing because of, because of fluid accumulation in the lungs. Okay? So that's the time frisemide will come into play. Even after giving frisemide, patient is not improving, then the next you add is the spironolactone. If it still doesn't improve, then you can give either a selective beta blocker or digoxin. Remember, digoxin is the last line treatment you give. Usually for a heart failure patient, we would not go for digoxin because it has a lot of side effect. Previously, we used to, but nowadays, these medications like ACE inhibitor, frisemide, spironolactone, these are very good. Now tell me, how about this beta blocker? Can you give it to a patient who is actively or having a decongested heart failure, like at the moment patient having symptomatic heart failure, can you give beta blocker to this patient? No, why? Because what you are doing, if the patient is symptomatic and it's a systolic heart failure, beta blocker is supposed to reduce the heart pumping. And if heart does not pump, what you are doing? You are actually worsening the heart failure in that way. But if a patient is euvolemic, then beta blocker remodels the heart and it gives some stability to the heart. So when patient becomes asymptomatic and euvolemic, that means no excess fluid accumulation, then only we add beta blocker in a heart failure patient. Okay, so ACE inhibitor, fusamide, spironolactone, beta blocker and digoxin. That's the stepwise method of treatment. You don't need to memorize the dose of the medication for AMC MCQ. Just the name of the medication is fine. See this one, the diuretic is only needed if patient is having fluid overload symptom.
see that beta adrenergic blocker like beta blockers play an important role of heart failure therapy along with ace inhibitors beta blocker also decrease mortality hospitalization and improve the functionality of the patient so sometimes question comes in exam which improves mortality in a patient with heart failure so ace inhibitor and beta blocker they improve mortality rate okay start patient on beta blocker after stabilization of the symptoms with diuretic and ace inhibitor you don't need to worry about blood pressure status when you are using a beta blocker okay and the beta blocker that you are use is not the propanolol that means not the non selective one you use the selective beta blocker like cardi carvedilol metoprolol atinolol bisoprolol those medication so that was your systolic heart failure management come to the diastolic heart failure yes usually diastolic heart failure needs treating the underlying cause if someone having hypertension you need to treat that okay having diabetes you need to control that the best treatment for someone with a diastolic heart failure is calcium channel blocker and beta blocker why because diastolic heart failure patient that main issue is with their relaxation so if you can lower down their heart rate what will happen the heart will get enough time to get relaxed or get filled up so that's why calcium channel blocker which is the rate limiting agent like verapamil diltiazem or beta blocker that should be your first line choice and that's the reason it is very important to diagnose the heart failure patient as a specific subtype like is it systolic or diastolic if possible avoid diuretics digoxin nitrate and nifedipine in this patient and this is very important ace inhibitor beta blocker spironolactone shows improvement of survival rate in a patient with congestive heart failure so that's pretty much everything about heart failure right it's not very hard right now one of the other thing i wanted to just add on which is the acute pulmonary edema in acute pulmonary edema patient will present to you with sudden onset of severe shortness of breath and if you if you find out you will find out the other features of heart failure especially left heart failure like s3 gallop rhythm bivesicular capitation and if you do a x ray on that patient you will get the patient having features of pulmonary edema in their chest x ray this one is what i was talking about it's a medical emergency because once it becomes pulmonary edema patient will not have enough gaseous exchange and that can lead to respiratory failure so that comes in exam in many ways if you look at here you can't see the border of the heart properly because of the congestion and the most important finding that you see is called batwing appearance so bilateral whitening of your heart and that's what we call as batwing appearance in pulmonary edema see this one so that's called batwing appearance very commonly asked in the exam so this patient will have increased respiratory rate they will have cyanosis they will have bivesicular capitation even pink frothy sputum coming out with their coughing the treatment this patient is to be admitted in the hospital put the patient in a propped up position if oxygen saturation is low start with oxygen this patient will need diuretic treatment immediately okay so start furosemide as soon as possible you can give morphine to this patient nitroglycerin to reduce preload or to reduce the amount of blood coming to the heart so the but the main thing is furosemide and propped up position that's the main treatment
some of the medications that we commonly use in a heart failure patient comes in many ways in the exam. In exam, side effect of medication is so important. So medication induced side effect comes in so many ways in the exam, you can't even, even you can't even have an idea about it. So it, it's so important, especially the common drug side effect, you should know about it. So we use some diuretics in heart failure or hypertensive patient like thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics, usually we use for hypertension, not too much for heart failure. Thiazide diuretics can cause some complications, especially it can cause hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia. It can cause hyperuricemia and can result in gout. So gout patient, you can't use this medication. It can also cause agranulocytosis or leukopenia. It can increase the glucose intolerance in a patient. That means diabetic patient, we, we will try not to use this medication. But these electrolyte abnormalities are very important. Indapamide is same like thiazide, but hyponatremia, hypokalemia, these are less common than thiazide. Then come to the loop diuretics, which is your frusemide, commonly used in heart failure patient. It also causes every type of electrolyte abnormality, hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia. It also causes metabolic alkalosis, hyperuricemia. It has a specific side effect that it causes autotoxicity. Okay, that means it can cause toxicity in the ear and patient can have hearing loss. The another one which is also very commonly used in heart failure patient, that's spironolactin. Spironolactin is a potassium sparing diuretics. All other diuretics causes hypokalemia, but this one increase potassium in the body. So the side effect is hyperkalemia and gynecomasia. It is very important that someone coming to you with a gynecomasia and that patient is on spironolactin, you should always think that the spironolactin is the cause of gynecomasia. Okay, most, most common drug cause of gynecomasia is a spironolactin. And then digoxin. Now, sometimes side effect of digoxin comes in exam. If you start a patient with digoxin, you should be careful about the side effect or toxicity of digoxin because it has got a very, very low therapeutic index. So even with a small exposition can have a toxic effect of digitalis or digoxin. So the most common side effect is nausea, vomiting, gynecomasia, blurring of vision, you know, halo around the objects and it can cause almost every kind of arrhythmia that you can have. But the most common is this paroxysmal atrial tachycardia or PVC, which is the premature ventricular complex. What is the treatment? Now, the first thing that you can do in a patient with digoxin toxicity that you can check their digoxin level. Now, even sometimes digoxin level can be normal, but still patient can have toxicity. In that case, symptoms will say that this patient having toxicity or not. What you need to do, if you get the features of toxicity, you stop the drug. And even after stopping the drug patient not getting better, you can use some anti antidote that is known as DigiBind. So DigiBind is usually used for acute overdose or intoxication from digoxin. All right, any question guys? Now, one of the important thing that you can learn and you will be very, very interesting fact from digoxin toxicity. So digoxin works by inhibition of sodium potassium ATPase pump. If the sodium potassium pump is not working properly, so let's say this is a cell, in your body.
normally calcium so what happens sodium is supposed so what usually happens that in this patient if there is inhibition of sodium potassium pump there will be increased intracellular concentration of sodium normally with this pump sodium goes outside the cell to the interstitial space and potassium comes inside and during this process also there will be an exchange of calcium okay so sodium goes out calcium goes out that's how this sodium potassium pump should happen but when this pump is inhibited there is sodium inside the cell but most importantly there is increase in the intracellular calcium if in the cell calcium is high what it causes it causes increased contraction of muscles and that's how digoxin works it causes increased contraction of the heart muscle now the important part is there is a receptor for sodium potassium pump in every cell to have this exchange of sodium potassium in and out of the cell potassium needs to bind with this receptor just similar like that your digoxin competes with potassium to get attached with this receptor so both digoxin and potassium they they need this receptor to go inside the cell now what happens if someone having decreased potassium level in their body then lot of digoxin will come and get entry into the cell so the thing is if someone having hypokalemia or decreased potassium in their blood more digoxin will go inside the cell and there is a possibility of digoxin toxicity in that time when more digoxin is coming inside the cell potassium is not able to come into the cell so there is lot of potassium in the blood now and what will cause what will happen then there will be hyperkalemia so that's the reason that digoxin sometimes can cause hyperkalemia okay and if someone having hypokalemia there there can be digoxin toxicity so that's a very interesting fact that if you understand you will you will really enjoy it that how physiology works in our body just remember one thing out of all this discussion that digoxin can cause hyperkalemia all good guys so that's pretty much everything about the heart failure do you guys have any questions so far moving on moving into the next one which is called valvular heart disease very important especially for valvular heart disease don't bother too much about aortic stenosis mitral stenosis all of this thing yes dr umaima we can explain the digoxin thing again now what happens is that the sodium potassium pump in the cell it regulates the en entry of potassium into the cell and exit of sodium outside the cell and in this process also calcium get out of the cell when this pump is not working properly then there will be increased calcium in the body in the cell that means 
increased calcium in the cell increases the intracellular calcium capacity. If intracellular calcium gets high, there will be increased muscle contraction and that's how digoxin works. Now this digoxin, now for the sodium potassium pump, there is a receptor where potassium needs to be add, needs to get attached to get inside the cell. It's a normal physiology. Now, when you give digoxin to a patient, digoxin compete with the potassium to attach with this receptor to go into the cell. Now, if some, it's just a kind of race. If you, if you have more digoxin in the body, digoxin will go in, will be a winner and potassium will lose. So then digoxin go in, into this receptor and into the cell. So what happens? More digoxin going into the cell, but potassium is outside the cell. That means in the interstitial space or in the, in the blood. So what will happen? It increases the potassium level in, the, in your blood eventually. Okay, so in the process of increased digoxin going inside the cell, potassium is not able to go inside the cell. So it stays in the blood and in, blood and in the interstitial space. So it causes hyperkalemia eventually. Next is valvular heart disease. In valvular heart disease, as I was saying, that you don't need to know the specific valvular condition. Only thing that comes in the exam is about the murmur. So you need to know this murmur really, really good because a lot of question comes. And if you want, you should go to the med bullet, this link. It has all the murmurs and everything written very precisely. And that usually gives you the whole idea that you need. Now, let me show you a very good trick to remember this heart, this murmur. You know that there are four, four positions in your heart. That means four valve having four position in your precordium, right? So if this is your, this is the sternum and these are your intercostal space. There's the left side and there's the right side. Okay, let's say that this is your second intercostal, third, fourth, and fifth intercostal. At the left fifth intercostal space, that's your mitral valve. So all the mitral murmur you will feel in here. Okay, then you have tricuspid and aortic valve. Aortic valve is usually, it's like this. So you get aortic valvular murmur in two positions. Sometimes you get in the left fourth intercostal space along the sternal border. Sometimes you get in the right second intercostal space, depending on the type of murmur. Then you have pulmonary murmur or pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery comes like this. So it goes to the left side. Although it's a right, right heart artery, it goes like this towards the left. So you get the pulmonary valvular murmur in the left second intercostal space. Okay. The tricuspid murmur is also along the fourth intercostal space in here, in the right side. So this is your all the murmur position. Now, let's start with one by one. You just need to remember one murmur and that will give you a whole other murmur thing. And especially the important murmur for the exam. 
Remember only one murmur, which is your MS, mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis gives you a mid-diastolic murmur. And where you will get this murmur? In the left fifth intercostal space. You already know it by this, by this picture. So mitral stenosis, when you get a valvular disorder in your heart, so this is your mitral valve. There are two types of valvular problem. One, the valve gets too narrowed and then blood cannot pass through this valve. And when excess blood pass, passes through this narrowed valve, it produces a sound, which is the murmur. And that is called a stenosis. And there could be regurgitation. Regurgitation means the valve has some door or leaflet. If this door is not working properly, sometimes blood from the ventricle can regurgitate back to the atrium. And that is called regurgitation. So you will get stenosis and regurgitation in valvular disorders. So you will get mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation in this way. So mitral stenosis, this is the only murmur that you will remember, mid-diastolic murmur. Now, how we can memorize or how we can remember it What is the opposite of MS? If you come in here, these are all, these are all the valvular disorder. So you have aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, all of it. You have aortic regurgitation. Now, when I say opposite, it means that mitral opposite is aortic, stenosis opposite is regurgitation. Okay, in this way you can remember. Okay, so mitral, we will keep remember that mitral opposite is aortic and opposite of stenosis is regurgitation. So mitral opposite aortic, opposite of stenosis is regurgitation. So we have got aortic regurgitation that also give you the similar diastolic murmur. So this way you know at least that which one is diastolic and which one is systolic murmur. And it's very easy. If one is mid-diastolic murmur, the other diastolic murmur that we have is called early diastolic murmur. Okay? So you have got MS and AR which is both diastolic murmur. One is mid-diastolic, another is early diastolic. Now just think about the opposite of this, this two. So if what we are left with from here, we have MR and AS, right? Mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis because mitral stenosis is already done. We have mitral regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation done, we have aortic stenosis. These two murmur will be systolic murmur. You just need to remember which one is ejection systolic murmur and which one is end systolic murmur. Aortic stenosis is ejection systolic murmur. And mitral regurgitation is the pan systolic or hollow systolic murmur. Okay, now there is no mnemonic that you can memorize to remember these murmurs. But this is, this is one of the way I used to remember how, like in the exam, you will not get confused if you know that which one is diastolic and which one is systolic murmur. Becomes so easy to exclude a lot of options. Okay, do you guys understand it?
Great. Now just go through the site of this murmur. Aortic stenosis murmur. It's a ejection systolic murmur in the right second intercostal space. Remember I said that one of the aortic murmur comes in the right second intercostal space. That's your aortic stenosis murmur. Okay. Mitral regurgitation, that's a hollow systolic or pan-systolic murmur in the mitral area, which is the apex of your heart. And mitral regurgitation murmur radiate to axilla. There are two murmur which radiate. One is mitral regurgitation, another is aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis murmur radiate to the neck or carotid. You, you don't need to memorize the tricuspid thing or pulmonary thing. It never comes in exam. Then you have aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis, we already know, it's a mid-diastolic murmur. And mitral murmur always based hard in the apex, which is the left fifth intercostal space. Whereas aortic regurgitation, that's the early diastolic murmur. And that's usually you will find out in left fourth intercostal space along the external border. There are murmur which changes with position and respiration. Especially mitral stenosis or mitral murmur, you will feel, you will get it better if patient lies to their left hand side. Okay. An aortic murmur best hard if they lean forward. So these are the two things which you can also remember that aortic murmur best hard when leaning forward, mitral murmur best hard on the left lateral side lying. If you can remember up to this in the murmur, I can assure you the questions that come in the exam in, in terms of murmur related thing, you will be able to get it, okay? Okay, let's take a five minute break because your head might be bursting at the moment. And after that, we'll do this cardiomyopathies. And then we'll go for some of the other, not very really important topics, but still it's important to know. And then later on, we'll go to the hypertension, which is very, very important. So let's take a five minute break and then we will start again. Thank you all.
All right, so let's just start again. So now we start with the cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy means that the muscle of the heart is not working properly, right? That's why it's called cardiomyopathy. There are three types of cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now, starting with the dilated cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy means the, the problem is in here is the diminished myocardial contractility. That means the heart muscle is not contracting properly. Okay, and that means that the, somehow it might be congenital, might be due to some underlying causes, or sometimes even with a lot of alcohol, diabetes, a lot of underlying causes, the heart muscle can be totally relaxed and it's totally dilated. And if it is very dilated, it's not able to contract properly. If it is not able to contract properly, what will happen? What kind of heart failure you will get in this patient, guys. Systolic heart failure, right? So this patient will present to you with features of systolic heart failure. And these are all the causes. Idiopathic is the most common, alcoholic, peripartum. A lot of causes are there. You don't need to remember it. And clinical signs and symptoms will be just similar to the systolic heart failure. Because these patients are usually having systolic heart failure, the treatment is also similar to systolic heart failure patient. Now, for this patient, the, the best treatment is to go for an implantable defibrillator. If a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy have an ejection fraction less than 35%, they can have this implantable defibrillator and that increase their survival rate. You can see that this is a normal heart and dilated cardiomyopathy looks like this. So very dilated. Next is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Very important for the exam. So what does it mean actually? Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy means that the ventricle, especially the left ventricular septum, gets enlarged or hypertrophic. Have a look. So this is the normal left ventricle and also the ventricular septum. Now, if you have a look to this ventricular septum, you can see how much enlarged it is. The whole ventricular muscle also gets enlarged or hypertrophic. What happens in this patient you can see that this is the aortic valve opening. Sometimes it can become so hypertrophic that it can reduce the cardiac output because at the moment, it's causing an obstruction of the heart blood flow from the left ventricle to the aorta, right? Because it's, it's very narrowed area. So sometimes because of that, it also gives a kind of murmur in this patient. So this is one of the cardiomyopathy, which causes murmur. Now, we, we call it as a HOCAM, H-O-C-M. So HOCAM can happen without any familial history, but in 60% cases, there is a hereditary chance, and it's an autosomal dominant trait. The main Hallmark of the disease is myocardial hypertrophy causing thickening of the interventricular septum. As a result of the hypertrophy, the ventricular compliance is reduced. That means there is not too much space for the, for the blood to be in this left ventricle. Systolic performance is fine. Diastolic dysfunction will be the main problem. Obviously, you understand that if there is not too much space for the blood. There will be not enough, enough blood which will come in this lead ventricle. And that is exactly what is diastolic heart failure is. The heart becomes hypercontractile and systole, systole will occur with striking rapidity. So 
some because your heart muscle is so enlarged and so strong the systole or contraction is so high sometimes ejection fraction you get like 80 to 90 percent in here okay Clinical manifestation is similar like diastolic heart failure. Apart from that, you can also get bifid carotid pulse, S4 gallop rhythm, systolic murmur, as well as a mitral regurgitation murmur. More common is this some systolic murmur. And you can get a large jugular A wave. It's not very important, but just remember bifid carotid pulse and systolic and mitral murmur. Now, sometimes in the history or in the question, you can get a clue that patient had a history of sudden cardiac death in the family in younger age. Okay, because many times patient with hookum, they, they are underdiagnosed or asymptomatic. So sometimes it can be very tricky. So sudden cardiac death can be positive in the family as well. The first line investigation that you do in this patient is ECG. So ECG is your first thing. It will not diagnose the condition, but sometimes you can get left ventricular hypertrophy. To confirm the diagnosis, you have to do an echocardiogram. Now, question comes in many, many ways. When we will do the question solvation, you will understand it. Echocardiogram, we are doing a resting echo. That means patient is not walking or doing any exercise. But most of the patient usually have symptoms when they do exertion, exercise, or even playing at, at the field. So if you, do, if you are suspicious and your resting echo comes normal, you have to do a, a stress echocardiogram. And during the stress echo, sometimes these things can be confirmed also. So if there is enough family history, and first degree relative diagnosed with hookum, patient having symptoms, especially having a syncopal attack when playing or doing exercise, you have to go to the stress echo. Treatment. Treatment will be similar like a diastolic heart failure. So beta blocker or calcium channel blocker will be your main choice. Please avoid giving them diuretics, vasodilator, or digoxin. Why digoxin? Because digoxin will cause increased muscle contraction. This patient already having too much contraction. You don't need any more. So it, it will just worse the condition. Why not diuretics? Because this patient already having lack of ventricular compliance. If you're giving diuretics to this patient, patient will lose more blood or more fluid from the body. So it will cause worsening of the heart failure. Okay, so that's pretty much everything about hookum. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is very rare, least common cause. In this case, restrictive means the heart myocardium becomes rigid and when it becomes rigid, it does not relax. So it becomes stiff like this. Okay, so it does not relax, it does not contract properly. So it just it just loses elasticity. Okay. So the myocardium is rigid and non-compliant, which causes lack of ventricular feeling and abnormal diastolic function. Sometimes even systolic function is reduced. So in this patient, you can get both systolic and diastolic heart failure. Most of the patient usually, usually dies from heart failure because there is not much treatment for this condition. Next, so cardiomyopathies are done. Move on to acute pericarditis. Remember one of the during our chest pain class, we discussed a little bit about pericarditis. So pericarditis is the inflammation of the outer layer of your heart, which is the pericardium. So patient with pericarditis will present to you with a sudden onset of chest pain, retroesternally or in the left side of the chest, which get worse with lying down 
or taking a deep breath in. Gets better with sitting up and leaning forward. You can get a characteristic pericardial friction rub when you auscultate this patient. And the diagnosis is usually done by ECG and the echocardiogram. In the ECG, you will get widespread ST elevation. We will discuss this in the ECG class. The most commonly you will get in the exam, the patient had a recent viral flu-like illness. Other than that, what can cause pericarditis? Sometimes SLE patient can have it, which is a connective tissue disorder. Metabolic disorder, like renal failure patient can get uremic pericarditis. Sometimes some malignancy inflammation can cause it. Treatment. Treatment is mainly treating the underlying cause. And because that's mainly pain is the main symptom, you just treat the pain with anti-inflammatories like aspirin, NSAID. If it is severe, then you can give a steroid. If NSAID is contraindicated, you can also give colchicine to this patient. Next is pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion means that this is your heart and that, that's the outer layer of the heart, that's your pericardium. Now, if in between the two layers of the pericardium, there is accumulation of fluid, that's the time when we call it pericardial effusion. Usually patient with any kind of pericardial disease eventually can end up having a pericardial effusion. Like pericarditis patient can have pericardial effusion later on. And there are so, some other features also like some of the transgenitive causes and exudative causes are there. Like heart failure patient can get it, liver failure, kidney failure patient can get it. Sometimes infection like tuberculosis, malignancy, those things can also cause pericardial effusion. Sometimes just after a stab or a penetrating trauma to the chest, patient can develop hemopericardium. So that's blood accumulation in the pericardial space. Now the important thing why I'm discussing it, that it's important, when you get too much fluid in, in the pericardial cavity, it can start causing compression over your heart. And what you will have, eventually, you will not be able to relax properly. So your heart is getting compression. So your heart will not be able to get relaxed. So there will be impaired blood feeling. And the patient will develop a condition known as cardiac tamponade, which is medical emergency. Okay? How you can confirm it? Echocardiogram is the only thing that will confirm. If a patient develops a heart shadow like this, you should think that this is most likely a pericardial effusion. And it's a, there is a name for this, which you call, have a look, water bottle shadow of the cardiac silhouette. See, the, see that it looks like a water bottle? So that's your pericardial effusion. Now, cardiac tamponade, it means that it's a life-threatening condi condition in which pericardial effusion has developed so rapidly or has become so large that it's compressing your heart. And patient with this will present to you with sudden onset of dyspnea, orthopnea. They will also have raised GVP with a clear lung, they will have shock or hypotension because now the heart is covered with fluid or blood. You will not be able to hear the heart sound properly, which we call muffled heart sound. And that has a triad, which we call big triad. So big triad of acute tamponade means low blood pressure, distended neck vein or raised JVP and muffled heart sound. If you get three of these, this patient having a cardiac tamponade. 
And what do you have to do? You have to go for an echocardiogram, like a bedside echocardiogram, and immediately you have to go for pericardiosynthesis. So insert a needle in the pericardial cavity and drain that fluid. Clear, guys? Any question? All good. All right. Now, constrictive pericarditis, it does not come in exam, but you still just have an idea about it. What is constrictive pericarditis? It's the diffuse thickening of the pericardium in response to some prior inflammation. So if the pericardium becomes thickened, what will happen? Again, same thing. There will be reduced capacity of your heart to get relaxed or distended, okay? So again, abnormal diastolic feeling is the main pathophysiology of constrictive pericarditis. This patient usually present with heart failure-like features. In this constrictive pericarditis, patient will have dyspnea or tupnea. They will have also features of right heart failure like ascites, peripheral edema, hepatic enlargement, Okay, the hard sound will be distant in here as well. Now, constrictive pericarditis, the way to diagnose this condition, that if you do a chest X-ray, you will find out there will be cal calcium deposition around the hard border. And that's, that's what actually caused the pericardial thickening. And you can see a egg shell appearance See the white thickening area? This demarcated heart, that is what you get in a constrictive pericarditis patient. It doesn't come in exam, so don't bother too much with this. So far, that's, what, that's mostly about our some of the random topics in, in cardiology, okay? Let's move on to the new chapter, chapter 86 of Jan Murta, which is hypertension. Hypertension is a very well-known topic for all of you. Now it's not very hard, but question comes from here in so many ways. Now, what is normal, normal blood pressure in a patient. Normally, we would like to keep it as systolic below 130 and diastolic below 85. Even like high normal, like 140 by 90, that's the highest that we can go in terms of hypertension. If it is more than equal to 140 by 90, that's hypertension. There are grade one, two, three, mild, moderate, and severe. Have a look on this so that you can remember which one is mild, moderate, and severe, okay? There is also another important thing. There is a lot of screening question comes in the exam. One of the screening that we do is blood pressure screening. For all adults who is more than equal 18 years of old, we should check their blood pressure, okay? And normally, for adults aged 18 years and older, we diagnose hypertension on repetitive measurement of diastolic blood pressure more than 90 and or all systolic more than 140. That means someone having 130 by 90, that's hypertension because diastolic is more than equal to 90. Someone having 125 by 100 or let's say 95, that's also hypertension because diastolic is high, okay? 
So any of these two high, that means it's a hypertension, but not just single, single time. It has to be multiple session. At least two occasion, patients should have a high blood pressure. There are some causes of hypertension, but 95% cases, there is no cause, which we call primary or essential hypertension. So another 5% is the secondary. So what, what could cause hypertension? Kidney-related cause like glomerulonephritis. Renal artery stenosis is very important, comes in exam. Some of the endocrine-related like Conn syndrome, Cushing syndrome, pheochromocytoma. Patient on oral contraceptive can have hypertension. Quartration of aorta can have it. Sometimes some of the drugs can increase blood pressure like NSAID or a steroid. Now, clinical features which suggest secondary hypertension, these are the things which given in your exam question and you just need to get this clue so that you know what they're asking about. Like in case of renal artery stenosis, you get a renal buoy in the abdomen. For glomerulonephritis, we will discuss it in our nephrology class, but for glomerulonephritis, you get proteinuria, hematuria, and red cell cast. For polycystic kidney disease, there will be kidney will be enlarged and you can feel it in the abdomen. So ballotable kidney sometimes comes with hematuria and also family history of kidney disease. That's polycystic kidney disease. Quartation of aorta, there will be delayed femoral pulse or radio femoral delay or radio radial delay. We will discuss those things, but just remember for quartation of aorta, these are the signs. Patient with sleep apnea, like OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, they can also get hypertension. So we already discussed physical finding that suggests secondary hypertension. One is epigastric brewery or renal brewery that suggests kidney artery stenosis. If you get flank mass, suggests polycystic kidney, femoral pulse delayed, suggests coarctation of aorta, truncal obesity with stria, Cushing syndrome, episodic sweating, pallor, tachycardia, flushing of the face that suggests few chromocytoma. So all of these things will be discussed in their specific theory classes. So let's not worry about it at the moment. There are two other terms called malignant hypertension and refractory hypertension. Malignant hypertension means if diastolic blood pressure more than 120. With that, patient also having some vasculopathy in the retina or kidney. That means end organ damage has already happened. Like patient having vision problem, kidney problem with a high diastolic blood pressure. What is refractory hypertension? Hypertension despite maximum doses of two drugs for three to four months. So if you give two drugs for the maximum dose, still blood pressure is not going down. That's refractory hypertension. These are not very important. Renal artery stenosis. So patient with renal artery stenosis, they, they usually get hypertension. And most of the time, it's idiopathic or there are two subtypes, one that young girl or young female getting it most likely presents with fibromuscular dysplasia and most of the other population get it as a part of atherosclerosis. Whatever it is, your diagnosis is only confirmed by a Doppler ultrasound. So if you do a Doppler or duplex ultrasound of the renal artery, it will give you the diagnosis. And this is the BP measurement recommendation or screening. All people aged 18 years and over, we should check their BP every two years. Now, diagnosis of hypertension cannot be made on the basis of a single visit. 
If you get an initial raised BP, that should be confirmed on at least two other visits within a space of three months. And if in that time still the blood pressure is high, then you can diagnose the patient as hypertension. This table is important, so keep an keep a eye on this and try to remember it. Like the what is the action or recommendation of hypertension depending on their level. Like if it is a grade one hypertension, you should confirm it by doing a repeat test or repeat checking of blood pressure within three months and start the patient with lifestyle advice. Lifestyle modification plays an important role in Australia. We just don't start someone with medication in, at the first. We give some time for the patient to try with their lifestyle modification. Always remember that. Grade two or moderate hypertension. In that case, you need to evaluate the patient within one month and start with lifestyle advice. Okay, now within one month, if patient is still having hypertension, you can start medication based on their five-yearly cardiovascular risk. We'll go for that later on. If it is third degree or severe hypertension, this patient, you can immediately start the medication. So if mild hypertension is found, observation with a repetitive measurement over three to six months should be followed before starting treatment. If initial diastolic blood pressure is more than equal 115, or patient having target organ damage, like there is problem with eye or problem with kidney, that patient can be started with drug treatment immediately. Okay. So these are little important thing that comes in exam. I know it's not quite interesting, but still you need to remember it. There is another term called ambulatory 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. What is that? Some patient can have high blood pressure when they come to the GP clinic or to the hospital. But when you take it at their home, it's totally normal. And that is what we call as white coat hypertension, right? For those patients, if you get a tumor and you start treatment, but normally this patient does not have hypertension, just to avoid that problem, you can give, you can do an ambulatory 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. So patient will have the blood pressure monitor attached and they will do their usual stuff. And throughout the 24 hour, that device will record the patient blood pressure. And that's how we can say what is the average blood pressure for the patient, okay? So if there is like a marked discrepancy between home BP and office BP, then you should do it. Also resistant to drug treatment, two reading above 140-90, unusual variability of office BP, like first session you have got 140 by 90, second time you have got 170 by 110. This is very unusual. Like within one, within three months, this, if this happens, not very usual. So in those cases, you can do this 24-hour ambulatory BP monitoring. Now come to the management. Always start with the non-pharmacological or lifestyle measure. So if the diastolic blood pressure less than 115, no evidence of end organ damage, then non-pharmacological therapy indicated for a three-month period without any antihypertensive. And what is the best behavioral intervention? Weight reduction. If you can reduce weight, like for every one kilo of weight lost, blood pressure drop by 2.5 systolic and 1.5 diastolic. Okay, so that's why it's so important. And apart from that, reduce alcohol, reduce alcohol, reduce sodium intake, those things also plays a good role. Now come to the management of hypertension based on the five-yearly risk assessment. We always do a cardiovascular risk assessment when we get a patient like this. 
So you have got hypertensive patient on several occasion. You have started lifestyle changes and now assessing the five-year risk assessment. If it is less than 10%, that means it's low risk, you can go for lifestyle modification for six to 12 months. For moderate risk, lifestyle modification for three to six months can be tried, and then you can consider drug treatment if it's still high. For high risk population, associated clinical condition or target organ damage, or a ethnic group who are high risk, like Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, those patients you should start treatment immediately. Okay? So a lot of things plays a role when we are starting medication in this patient. So what is the best method of treating this patient? So you can start with any of this medication as a first line. You can start ACE inhibitor or ARB, especially if patient is more than 55. Calcium channel blocker, if patient more than 65, you can start with low dose thiazide diuretic. So any of these A, C, or D is your first line medication. If target not reached after three months, then a combination of two or three drugs can be done. So you can either combine ACE inhibitor with calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor with thiazide, or very rarely ACE inhibitor with beta blocker. And last option is to go for three drugs, ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, and thiazide. Okay? A relatively ineffective combination is calcium channel and diuretic, ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. So usually this doesn't cause too much change. The best is ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor plus thiazide. Do not give someone both ACE inhibitor and ARB because they are basically same kind of medication. And both of them can increase potassium. So it will cause a massive hyperkalemia. Do not give, try not to give ACE inhibitor or ARB with a potassium sparing diuretic. Because potassium sparing causes hyperkalemia, this also causes hyperkalemia. Do not give both rate-limiting drug. Beta blocker reduce heart rate, verapamil also reduce heart rate. So this patient can get a heart block from the medication. So these are the medications combination that we don't usually give. The next is that sometimes question comes, it just don't come so simple in the exam. They give you some comorbidities and then they ask you what is the best choice of antihypertensive for this patient. That's why you need to know which medication cannot be given in some particular condition. Like let's say asthma or COPD patient, you can give all medication except beta blocker because beta blocker can cause bronchospasm. Someone having constipation, try not to give calcium channel blocker or diuretic because it can cause constipation. So for them, ACE inhibitor or ARB will be best. Same with the bradycardia or heart block patient. You should not give rate limiting drug like calcium channel blocker or beta blocker. For cardiac failure, ACE inhibitor is the best and then diuretics. Do not give calcium channel blocker in a cardiac failure patient, especially if it's a systolic heart failure. Diabetes, hyazide should not be given, but best is ACE inhibitor or ARBs. Same with dyslipidemia, hyazide can cause dyslipidemia, so better is the other drugs. Hyperuricemia, thiazide is contraindicated. Best is ACE inhibitor or calcium channel blocker. Ischemic heart disease, you can use anything. Peripheral vascular disease, you, can, you can't use beta blocker in a patient with peripheral vascular disease. But you should use calcium channel blocker in that patient because calcium channel blocker causes vasodilation. 
For pregnancy, you can't use thiazide or any of the diuretics, also no ACE inhibitor. For Raynaud phenomenon, again, you cannot use anything which causes vasoconstriction, like beta blocker is contraindicated. So what is best? Calcium channel blocker. Now, this is the very, very important part. For someone having renal artery stenosis, the best choice of medication initially is ACE inhibitor. Although in the GM it is cross, there is a reason for that. If someone having single, or you can say, like there are two kidney arteries, right? If single renal artery stenosis is there, best is ACE inhibitor or ARBs. But if both renal artery having stenosis or double renal artery stenosis or bilateral renal artery stenosis, that patient, you can't use ACE inhibitor or ARP. You can use CCBs. That means calcium channel blocker. Okay. So that's pretty much everything that you need to learn from hypertension, guys. I know that this is tricky. This is a lot to take in just one class, but now you know what to read from cardiology, right? And you can start your preparation. And we, as I said initially, that I'm not going to do the palpitation chapter because we do it with the ECG, okay? So that's the only chapter that is left from cardiology. And in pediatrics, we also have a little bit of cardio, cardiology discussion, especially for the congenital heart disease. That's the only two things that's left from cardiology. Others are all done. So do you guys enjoy it? Or it's so boring that you, you are sleeping? If you want, you can unmute yourself and talk to me. That's also fine. We, we, we usually like to talk to you after the class, especially for any, any other thing. So cardiology is fun if you really understand it. If you remember that when we discuss the systolic and diastolic heart failure thing, that pathophysiology is needed for everything that we have discussed today. Right? So a little bit of pathophysiology or having a good knowledge on physiology helps a lot with understanding. You can't memorize this stuff. If you don't understand these things, there is no way you can memorize it. And it's not fun to memorize also. Yes, Dr. Nafisa, we can discuss about the different position of the murmur. That's fine. So if you guys really like it, I would advise you or I would, I would say that let your other partners know about the class and course. Ask them to do the free sessions. You can share our Facebook group link with them so that they also get to know us and they, they get to listen to what we, are sh what we are trying to show you, okay? It's very really important not to, just, not to just go somewhere with just a one class as a trial session. You need to know how the class occurs, how the course occurs. Otherwise, like, you will find out eventually that no, this is not the course that I wanted. And don't get into any, any trap from anyone that if you just do some questions and then you will pass the exam. The exams are getting hard every, every year, okay? And very unlikely that just by doing some questions or QBank, you will be able to pass the exam. It's not like that, okay? If someone is saying that, they are not showing you the correct path. And it's very important because now you are you are going to be a doctor in here, you need to have a good knowledge on these things. Otherwise, in your life ahead, you will always feel a lack of knowledge, okay? And this lack of knowledge will haunt you when, they, when you will try to treat your patient in the practice, 
Okay, it's a, it's a really important to know these things because eventually you will be a doctor working in Australia or maybe in, in your country, you are already practicing. So you need to know about it. Yeah, so this is all from cardiology, leaving the palpitation and ECG for the course student. The next class is on, let me have a look. I always forget the schedule. Next class will be on 15th, right? Yeah, so it should be Tuesday. And also do not forget to, to join our question solvation class. It's a random question solvation class that usually taken by one of our another doctor, Dr. Rabia. So she will take the class at that time. And I guess that you get to know her as well. Okay, so that you understand how she's doing with you. Okay. So let's discuss the murmur position a little bit for someone who asked it. So in murmur position, you just remember the intercostal space like this. So let's say second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth intercostal space. That's the sternum, okay? Now, this is your apex the left fifth intercostal space. And usually you get mitral murmur in here. Then you have got aortic murmur. Aortic murmur, because aorta comes like this. This is the right and left. Aortic stenosis murmur is in the right second intercostal space, whereas aortic regurgitation murmur is in the left, left fourth intercostal space. Okay, now the pulmonary murmur, pulmonary valve goes like this. So it goes to the left. So you get pulmonary murmur in the left second intercostal space. Tricuspid you get in the right fourth intercostal space. So left fifth intercostal space, mitral murmur. Right second intercostal space aortic stenosis murmur, left fourth intercostal space aortic regurgitation murmur, left second intercostal space pulmonary murmur, right fourth intercostal space tricuspid murmur. I know it's a lot, right? But this is it. This is how you can easily remember. So, Dr. Umaima. There are two question solvation class coming up. One question, one on 15th February, that means on Tuesday, that's only on cardiology. That will be taken by me. And there is another recent question solvation class that's on 17th on Thursday will be taken by Dr. Rabia. And about the answer of the two questions, So case one, just by looking at systolic heart failure, sorry, just by looking at the ejection fraction, now you can say that it's systolic heart failure. And now look at the ejection fraction of case two, that's 65, that's a diastolic heart failure, okay? All good. So that should be our tonight session, guys. As you know that our course has already started. You guys are actually doing the course, but this is the first two-week session. We are at the end of the free two-week session. We just have two more classes. And from the next week, the, the main course will start. And I will also up, update the schedule of the class in, your, in the course group. I've seen a lot of you has already en enrolled, but still, if any of you want to enroll, feel free to inbox us or send an email. Okay, so we'll be happy to have you in the course.
And is, if there is any question regarding the course, feel free to go around the Facebook group for State AMC MCQ. It has all the information that you need. You can also ask us if, if there is any confusion that you want to ask. Okay. Thank you. So we'll see you again on Tuesday. Have a good night. Bye.